Okay, so I'm here with one of my newest mentees, Anya. And let's talk about this incredible success you've had with your fundraising initiative. So can we start by framing what it was that you were trying to do and what the initiative was? All right, so initially I was trying to raise money to create hygiene kits for people in need. My target audience was homeless women because they don't have access to menstrual care products because most of their money or the income that they have, they spend on diapers and food. They just don't have the means to have the most basic necessities. So I took it upon myself and I know a lot of other leaders are, but one of the initiatives that I had was to get money and fundraise for those menstrual care products as well as the hygiene kit. One of the things that I thought was so interesting was you started a couple of weeks ago, right? Three or four right. weeks ago. And your initial hit on it was that you were going to try and raise awareness. Now you weren't right. just saying you wanted to raise awareness. Yeah. Then as we talked, I was just the conduit of this. You came up with the idea of changing it from raising awareness to getting more specific. Raising awareness is very general. Right. Yeah. Leaning into actually putting hygiene kits. What was the process that you came up with on quantifying this by finding the number of homeless women and crawling that down? Can you talk a little bit about that process and how you, we worked on that together, but you let it charge on. Okay. So one of the ideas that we worked on together was involving statistics to make it more appealing for the public to donate. And we went on a bunch of different websites, especially the ones in that focused on the San Francisco statistics for homeless and the East Palo Alto. We came across shocking statistics where almost 50% of the population were women that were homeless on the street with their kids. I think that was a big factor of why we wanted to emphasize homeless women menstrual care product necessities. Yeah. And you were working with a partner with a company on this one, right? What was the right. what company? Talk about that dynamic and how you got involved with them. All right, so I reached out to a company around a month ago, and the company's name is Simply the Basics, and their mission is similar to mine. They empower students and different organizations to raise money, raise awareness to get these hygiene kits and get them into the hands of the needy. This is especially important because it's such a basic necessity, and it offers so many paths to just get jobs because a lot of people discriminate against people that aren't necessarily hygienic, but it isn't their fault because they just don't have the access or means to have any hygiene. What they're doing is very essential, and many people disregarded just because everyone has it and they don't think it's such a big deal but in reality it is and it makes as much as it of an impact as food or maybe not that it's like similar in that regard i would say what i hear you saying and correct me if i'm wrong is it's a basic human necessity right i mean yeah. it's human right to just be clean and have that and it makes you feel good about yourself too it empowers that self-confidence which is such a big factor as well absolutely can you talk more about that i think just having hygiene just makes you feel like a good person as people say the clothes you wear if you look good you feel good and that's a very essential basic fact if you know that you feel internally good then you exert that energy and people feel that you radiate that energy of being proper and having the means to just have a conversation without people discriminating against maybe your hygiene and cleanliness so i think that's really important in. Let's talk about more about how you ended up selecting this project. What was the rubric for the assignment and how did you end up selecting this project? It's a wonderful project and it seems like something that's close to you. Right, yes. As part of my club, I wanted to empower the students in them and the club to expand beyond whatever is in our community. One way I wanted to do that was delve into the topic of homelessness, which was previously selected at the start of this year. One way we could give back is through these hygiene kits. So we researched and gathered our materials, had some fundraising events, and I taught a lot of them how to market and sell this almost like a case into the hands of our audience, which was the Pinewood community, and we got the money for it. Two weeks in and we're $4,000. So it's amazing. I'm so happy everything turned out the way I wanted it to. You're two weeks in and we are now at February 26th of 2024 and this has been extended to when March we have till March 1st another few days let's rewind and talk about where you were when the fundraising began you had an initial goal of how much and let's talk about the evolution of that can you just speak about that so my initial goal was two thousand nine hundred dollars and we wanted 300 hygiene kits with around 100 extra menstrual care products and now that we've amplified our goal by x amount percent that's where we are and I couldn't be happier I hope to use these profits for my other adventures that I hope to have in the future it's really exciting you started at two thousand nine hundred three thousand dollars yeah and now you're 4100 bucks which is 34 35 percent higher than what you started it's gonna be very exciting for you is this your first time first this is fundraising time? yes it is. what kind of fears or apprehensions or what was it like emotionally going into trying to raise money were you confident going in were you not confident what kind of feelings did you have in your first venture for trying to raise money initially when i told people i had to raise $2,900 in around the two-week time frame that I had. Everyone was like, Anya, be so realistic. That's not possible. That's not viable. 
I think that motivated me to get to where I wanted to get because I am a go-getter and I want to get what I want to get done. Especially when people doubt me, I just feel like I need to prove them wrong. So that was my biggest motivation. And then my parents and Dan, they were all there to support me as well. And we created a game plan and I felt so much more confident going in knowing that I can achieve what my goal was. And I'm so glad we did and extended it. I proved a lot of people wrong, but it also showed me that I can have the confidence to achieve such a big deal. So that was my biggest takeaway. It is a really big deal. You are a high school junior now, correct? Correct. All right, you're a high school junior. This is your first rodeo when it comes to raising money. You made a really fast comment there, and I want to lean into that a little bit more. You're a go-getter, and you like to prove people wrong. Talk about that to me. I feel like I've been like that ever since I was a little girl. I always wanted to show everyone that my way was the right way. I know that sounds very egoistic of me, and I don't mean to come across like that. It's just I have a vision for what I want to get done. And if I can put everything in place and align everything to the way I want it done, and when people come across my judgment and tell me that something's not possible or this won't work or that won't work that in fact motivates me rather than take my confidence down so i think that was a big part of this process as well and confidence do you think confidence is there's one flavor of confidence or do you think that confidence shows up in a lot of different flavors and a lot of different ways for you and for other people what's your view when it comes to confidence i think confidence is something that you can build through facing your fears rather than other people letting you down i think i've built that through my voice and volume program and through all the community outreach and community services service that I've done, I think that made me grow such a big understanding for lower income communities and the problems that this world faces. And if I can do a small little change to fix it, I have hope that the future could be so much more positive because so many more people can make the same movements that I am and I can give people confidence to achieve the goals that I once had. I think I could spread, like you said, like a mentor and a mentee. If I can tell people that it is possible and you can get to the goals that you want to get to, it's just more hope and more positivity for the future. It's fascinating you bring this up because you and I have only been working together for a short time, month and a half right now, yes? Right. You've brought this idea of meta mentoring, right? I mentor you, you mentor other people, and you're helping me become a better mentor in the feedback that you give me. Yes. And so by becoming a better mentor for you, you then become a better mentor for other people. But you mentioned mentoring and spreading this forward, taking this forward for other people. Talk more about that, what you've learned, because that was a wonderful comment. Well, there's so many people that I've worked with personally that have similar ambitions and maybe different goals, but still have that passion to pursue what they want to do. If I can foster that confidence and leadership into them, the way that you've done to me or my parents have done for me, I know that they can get where they want to do. I see their motivation and their enthusiasm and I want to empower that and foster that. So that definitely comes from working and talking with people and brainstorming and creating ideas and pursuing them. I think that's so helpful. And then they go pass that on and that cycle. And that's so amazing to create. It's such a cool legacy to leave behind once I grow to college. And this is a legacy that you're creating already. And even in the short time that we've been working together, you brought this up before, legacy, creating things that, that have this ripple effect going forward. What was it that motivated you to contextualize this and bring this into focus for the homeless community in, in San Francisco and East Bay? Well, I brainstormed with my club earlier this year and we narrowed it down to education in lower income communities and homelessness since we finalized on those. I just researched more and I found that basic hygiene is a very, very big deal. There's not a lot of light shone upon it. So I just wanted to emphasize that and create more awareness around it. So students and also faculty and everyone around our community understood what a big impact it made. It's a fascinating comment that you made that there's not a lot of light shone upon it. And this came up in the conversation that we had a couple of weeks ago. And you brought this up about marketing where the more you focus, the more specific you are, the more people will pay attention. Yes, it's that the halo effect. We kind of touched upon this already with taking it from the raising awareness down to the homeless community of women and women with hygiene. Can you talk about that? What your perception is having gone through this for a couple of weeks and been incredibly successful with raising money, what you've learned and how you've taken that forward with respect to kind of the halo effect and, and narrowing down your focus. Once I started, I had a very broad perception of what I wanted to do, but I wasn't entirely sure. I just had an idea of what I wanted to do. As we worked together, we narrowed it down to researching and figuring out that if you win women and children over, you essentially win over the entire audience. So I stuck with that at the back of my mind and went full force. And I understood all the statistics that were associated with this and just talked to women and gave them an understanding of what it was like living as a woman in a lower income community and how if you're in a single income household raising kids, kids and taking care of yourself in general is a really big deal. And I want to emphasize that and create the significance around it. So we narrowed it down, creating that halo effect.
Yeah, so much wisdom, and, and not that wisdom is restricted to people, or there's any monopoly, older, younger, but for a young lady your age, so much wisdom. And one of the things that you just said really resonated with me, and I think will resonate with this audience. And what you're saying is going to help so many other kids and so many other parents out there who are struggling with this. How do I give my kid an advantage going to college and grad school and all of these things? You leaned into something fascinating, which is once you win the hearts and minds of the women in the audience, you've kind of got everybody. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Everyone knows that. Yeah. Happy wife, happy life. There's certain sayings that speak <laughs> with you and it's the truth. If you win the women and children over, you essentially win over everyone because they are the foundation of the nation and they have the emotional connect that I'm not going to stereotype anything, but it's just they do have a deeper emotional connect and it is easier to penetrate through that and make them understand the difficulties that a lot of other women in similar situations of them are facing. I thought that would be great to tap into and make them understand and realize and come to that conclusion of, oh, I am doing a good thing. I am making a difference. I just wanted people to have a taste of that because once you do understand that making a difference can leave such a big impact on the world, you just want to keep doing it. It's almost like an addictive type of thing. I think it's great to do like... <laughs> It could be very addictive and it's not a bad type of addiction. Yeah, I mean, there are positive and this ties in, you know, I mean, that one of the things and we spoke about this before you brought it up and I think it was a very, very wise comment is one of one of the things that we see in homeless communities around the country and around the world is prevalence of addiction, right? Well, this is one of the reasons many people end up on the street. And you talked about the positive addiction. Talk a little bit more about that, about how you become addicted to helping the world and taking that forward. Lean more into that if you would. Yeah, so I can talk from my own experience Experience. I started volunteering at RISE, which is an organization that helps enrich students in lower income communities, especially in elementary and middle school, to have motivation to go, go do good in school in the future and have motivation to go to a nice college and get out of the circle that their parents lived in. I built off that knowing that I went the three hours, four hours a week and going all the way to East Palo Alto and helping out there. And then once I became a sophomore in high school, I was like, I know I want to do more. I know that my passion is going to take me a lot further than just going and helping out once a week. I wanted to go and create something that was a legacy and a bigger project that was something that symbolized what I was passionate about. And so I created my club. And through that, I got so many connections and I reached out to a bunch of people, reach out to me, and I created a network where I could create an impact and Every night I lie awake and I think of different ways that I can help. And I just recently have some more ideas about connecting myself to lower income students and creating another mentorship program because they don't really have access to college education, counseling and stuff. So I wanted to empower them to do that as a peer to peer situation rather than an adult where they would feel slightly uncomfortable to talk to because they don't have that much to brag about. You have a lot to brag about. I, <laughs> I love the comment that you made. Well, you do. It's just fact. This is a blue shirt. This is a red pillow. You got a beige wall behind you and you've got a lot to brag about. Just fact. I'll just end with that piece for that statement. We'll have to edit this out. Well, this little weird transition here. Talk about <laughs> awkward moment in the interview. Okay, cool. <laughs> These bragging rights that you have and, and the lying awake at night, the lying awake at night, thinking about other initiatives that you want to take. Talk more about that and talk about maybe some of the initiatives that you've thought about. And we don't want to get as much sleep as possible, but lying awake at night, thinking about other ways that you can help people and coming up with other creative ideas. That's a quality problem. Talk more about that. <laughs> One of the ideas that I thought about was creating a podcast to raise awareness. I wanted to interview a couple nonprofit outreach managers that I've connected with over the past couple months, and especially Cheryl, which is the person that I work for at Rise. I wanted to interview her and raise awareness about why she started her nonprofit and what pros, what cons, what struggles she had, what skills it took to get to the best level that she is right now, what made her so successful. I wanted to do that with a couple other organizations and build this community of being involved and creating a difference. I want to inspire that change and this yeah. is just a way to do it what are some of the other entrepreneurial ideas or ideas that you've come up with as you've been thinking about this at night and losing sleep tell us about some of the other ones that have just come up because you've got a very fertile imagination when it comes to entrepreneurship another one i wanted to do was creating a website where i interview people from various different industries such as like marketing or real estate banking financing makeup whatever that weird awkward stage between high school and then graduation and college and then that college graduation to your job. There's a few awkward phases in there and I wanted to address that and create a one-stop shop where students and whoever else can click on these websites and click on these videos and I would get some sort of ad revenue as well. They would see what skills that I would take to get to these successful entrepreneurs and all these successful industry leaders. So that's another idea I had. I think that would be an amazing form of community building and network building. 
Very much so. Yeah, I'm just going to take an aside here and say that you should be lecturing at, at Wharton Business School and Stanford Business School already at the age that, that you are right now. Let's go back and talk about the, the nuts and bolts way that you went about raising the money because it was fascinating. Before we do that, can you talk about RISE and what RISE stands for and what, what that means? Good. And, and, the, right. and as well, the club that you started. Okay, so RISE starts, stands for Reaching and, and Inspiring Success Through Education. The biggest component of a ch child's life is their education, and that stays with them forever. That's something they cannot lose. At RISE, our mission is to empower that and foster that and grow and not let them ever lose that because that's their biggest asset as a student in a low-income community. To enrich that, we have tutoring programs and several other programs where they can connect with students that are in slightly more privileged area and have more resources. And and they create a database where they themselves can become mentors in the future for students that live in their same community and provide that mentorship idea back. And it always relates back to that. Once you become successful from a place where you were brought up that wasn't very resourceful, you always go back and you go back to your roots. And I feel like that idea is very prominent over there. Yeah. And for your roots, talking about your roots, is being of service and helping others something that is part of your roots, your family roots? Where does that imperative come from? That definitely is part of my family roots. Majority of my family, they're very big into philanthropy and giving back and I think I definitely got some of those traits passed down because I do want to make a difference and everybody wants their name and their brand to be seen a certain way and this is just an, a way I want me like my legacy to be left behind when I'm gone. God willing it'll be a long time before you're gone <laughs> young lady you're yeah. just on your way right now but you're future pacing yourself which is a great way to look at the world for any marketer. Yeah. Let's go back to the way that you actually raised the money because it was quite astonishing and we started talking about this earlier. How did you actually go about doing it? Because you started started with this partnership and you started not knowing how to go about doing it. And then we talked about just a kind of a tweak in your copy and the way that you did that. But this was your idea and I just gave you some hints along the way. Talk about that process. All right. So first we started off. I was a little bit confused on how to go about it. I had small little fundraising events at basketball games, just selling snacks. And then I decided that $200, $300 a game isn't going to necessarily get me to my goal as fast as I needed it to get me to. We moved on to asking for $100 donations or higher from parents at my community. And I tapped into my mom's friend group and they were such a help. And they were my biggest supporters. I'm so thankful that they donated all the money that they did for this cause. And then we expanded out to the Pinewood community itself. I sent out an email to the entire school telling them about my initiative. And then I also went to cars at 7 30 7 45 in the morning and i talked to them and i was like this is what i'm doing i would love your help and here's the qr code i gave them a quick little brief on what my the initiative was and what I'm trying to do and they were so pleased and they probably felt good to help too and I made sure to mention it was 100% tax deductible and you're going to make a big impact on these people's lives. Right yeah. so there's a marketing hook and again this was something that was your idea that came up along the way and I, I just helped gently nudge and guide you along the way with this one. You talked about the cars so can you be specific was this a drive through at your drop off at your school what was the actual sort of physical layout? Okay so this is how the parking lot works there's a top and then parents drive all the way around the loop and then they drop their kids off at the top and what I did was I stood at the top and I gave them a quick 15 to 30 minute spiel on what the initiative was about and why it would make such a big difference to me and other leaders that are trying to create a difference in the space and how much it would mean to everyone and they donated and I said what a personal connection would have both to them and to women in need maybe their ch wife maybe their daughters I'm not really sure maybe they didn't have any spouses but that was my hook I made sure to say it was 100% tax deductible. And a lot of people said yes. I think there might have been one or two that were like, sorry, I'm in a rush. I've got to go, which was totally understandable. It was eight in the morning. My parents might have said the same. So I don't blame them. But yeah. And again, it was 15 to 30, 15 to 30 seconds. You said minute, but I think the minute because it was so you were so committed, but 15 to 30 seconds, that's not a lot of time to get this marketing message. Yeah. So physically, how did you do it? Did you have a QR code on your shirt or did you hand it to them? What, what did you do? What I did was I had a bunch of flyers in my hand hand and all of them had a QR code on it and I wanted them to keep it at home with them always as a reminder but also I wanted them to scan it right in front of me and get it done as soon as possible because you know when people go home they don't always get that done so I wanted it to be yeah I wanted it to be done as soon as possible and then I sent that on their way home and they took it home and probably kids saw like maybe hang on the fridge and the side of the trash can like I don't really know but it kind of lingers with you when it stays there in your house 
That was not cool. Yeah, it does. Did you have any parents sign up for this right on the spot, just as you kind of leaned into their car window and handed this to them? A lot of them did. A lot of them were right on the spot, like right there. And they were just, it was like a one and done because it isn't a very long process. It's just your email and the card information. Let me see if I understand this. They scanned the QR code. You walked them through it. You said it was tax deductible. And on the spot within that 15 to 30 seconds, you were asking for $100 donations. Is that what it was? 100 or above and some gave 50 which is totally fine yeah. okay talk about it if you would because before we started recording we talked about this the change that you made in the copy because you had originally written the copy and then we talked about maybe making a refinement to the copy so that we could increase the conversion the number of people who were going to sign up versus the number of people who ended up signing up talk about right. that. you made a comment about emotion we moved the qr code to the top of the page and then i added some more statistics that are meaningful to me and to others that might affect others in my community. I added a more personal touch with my name and my grade and my initiative. Those were some tweaks that we made. The other thing too, is that you actually made the ask early on, right? You asked right away. This is what I'm trying to do. Please give. Right. right. Talk about how you actually did that. Did you contact the organization? Did you rewrite the copy itself? What were the nuts and bolts of how you made that happen? So I contacted the outreach manager. Her name is Brittany. And I probably bombarded her with way too many questions, but she made all of it possible. And I told her exactly what I wanted down and to implement those into the website. And I got it to where I liked it and where it was perfect for me. That's how it's going. And now we have till... March 1st to continue. So another three or three or four days to do this. And you're already past what your initial goal was. Or you're 30, yeah. originally 2,900 or 4,100 and change right now. I'm over the moon happy. I think this not only impacted my confidence, but just made me know that I can do what I put my mind to. I can do as much as other people say that I can't. I'm worthy of what I've gotten so far. Oh, you are more than worthy, Anya. I will tell you that. That's just a fact. I want to come back to a comment that you made again before we started, and we, we, we spoke about this the last time, about emotion and about how when people give, they feel a certain emotion. Can you lean into that and speak about that? It was an incredibly wise and insightful comment. Right. I feel like when you did put, give your time and put your energy into giving back to people that are in need, and everybody realizes it and everybody feels it, but when you see someone on the side of the road asking for money, you, you don't have the heart to give because if you give them, that means that you're in a full tangent of wanting to give to everyone. And it's one of those things that you can't control. So I decided to bring it just to a small cause where you can donate and hoping that maybe you can spread further into many other organizations and get them involved into the world of donating, giving back and giving their time to places where they were passionate about as well. Because mm. everybody has something that touches their heart and a little soft cor corn, once you tickle that spot, it's like, there you go. Like you're going to put all your energy into it and all your time and make sure that what you're doing is going to be impactful. Can you speak more about how, what do you think it takes to reach somebody emotionally such that they're willing to take action in case in point in 15 seconds, 30 seconds, you were able to get many parents to sign up right on the spot. What yeah. was it? What was the attack pattern that you took? What did you do? What were the buttons that you pushed to get people so quickly to, to push that emotional button or that you were able to touch their emotions such that they took action? Majority of it was the statistics and knowing that so many people, women are struggling on the streets with not being able to handle menstrual cycles and then also the fact that their children might not get three meals a day. And there's so many situations that happen in a single income household that are just out of their reach and knowing that these parents have means to give and know that they can help and give back their time and money is an effective way to get what they deserve like the people that deserve these hygiene kits like it's a necessity. And if you emphasize that, I feel like that's a major selling point. Yeah, absolutely. What other organizations or how do you see taking this forward in the short term? You talked about later when I'm gone, it'll be a long time. God willing, it'll be a very, very long time for you. But in the short term, we're going to be working together a long time. I'm very blessed that we'll be working together for a while, you and I. But maybe over the course of this next year until you graduate high school in another year and a half, where do you see this going and where would you like to see it? I definitely want to create a major, a passion project that I'm in, hope like something I'm more passionate about and create a nonprofit, hopefully in the future. And I definitely do want to involve somehow, this is a little bit unrelated, but I definitely do want to create a website of my heritage and my cultures and my traditions because I do think it's getting a little bit lost along the way because I'm a first generation kid going to college in my family in America. I think a lot of my traditions are getting lost because 
our focuses are different and the language there's a barrier between me and my grandparents so I definitely want to create a website emphasizing the importance of culture and the traditions I want to list all of them and have a detailed explanation of every single one. And then I definitely do want to do this mentoring program to give students in lower income communities this like college advice. And I think peer to peer is something I'm interested in doing. And I really want to. Yeah. So you brought up something fascinating, which is mentor mentorship. And that a lot of people think about mentorship. They think about older to younger in the case of you and I, but I hear you talking a lot about peer mentorship and actually mentoring peers. Can you speak more about that? Yeah, I think there's such a wide socioeconomic gap and a lot of kids in wealthier communities have access to college counselors and students in lower income communities don't necessarily get those opportunities and resources. I want to implement though that in those areas for no fee at all and just give them advice and what I would do to build their brand and profile and give them the confidence that they need to succeed in college and beyond and get into whatever they want to do and have that motivation to want to get their goals like I did. That's something I'm interested in doing, and I hope that I can make an impact on their lives just because, honestly, you can do whatever you put your mind to. And I know it's oh. a sin, but it's really, it's true. Well, yeah, you certainly are, are evidence of that. I want to come back to something you, you said, and it was great. Can you talk a little about your heritage and what your heritage is and your being first generation, and then we'll expand on that. I'm an Indian American, and my parents moved freshly from India, like about... I'm not going to say how many years ago because that might make them sound old. So I'm just going to keep that aside. So a couple of days ago, we had a religious festival in our house. And a lot of what my parents were doing, what they were saying, I didn't understand. And a lot of my cousins didn't really get either. And I don't want to lose that culture through the next couple of generations because that's that part of our side is dead. And I really do treasure it. And I miss it a lot because I don't get the same experiences I had when I lived in India. And I definitely want to expand on that because it's such a crucial part of our family right now. And I don't want my kids to miss out, my grandkids to miss out. So I want to create this app where my grandparents can either create cooking videos for recipes where our like homemade food is or like some sort of language lesson because mm -hmm. I Telugu at home. I want my kids to learn because I honestly am not very fluent at it. I don't want it to go lost over the, like the next couple of years. You're speaking about something that's really, really important. Correct me if I'm wrong. What I'm hearing you say is the honoring and the preservation and the furthering of, of cultural traditions. Now you talked about living in India. Can you speak about living in India and then moving here or moving back? Living in India Traditions that we had were celebrated so regularly in Indian culture, you know, that we celebrate so many different festivals. When we moved here, I noticed that a lot of the holidays that we celebrated together as a big family in India were dwindled down to smaller little family celebrations that weren't taken as seriously. And I do want to emphasize that when I'm older because I enjoyed it so much as a little kid running around hearing like eating all this good food, talking to your grandparents, having fun. And it's so much more than the festival. It's about bringing people together and creating this community of safety and importance. And I definitely don't want to lose that because it's impacted me so much, especially give me the morals that I for who I am today. And I want my kids to be able to enjoy it as much as I did because it's a right that they have and I don't want it to be lost. Where in India did you grow up? Can you talk a little bit about that history and, and the transition to the States? Yeah. Okay, so I grew up in uh, Whitefield, Bangalore. Then I moved here when I was around 10, 11 years old. And I've been here ever since. Okay. And are you still fluent? Are you, what, what, do you speak, what, what languages do you speak? I speak Telugu and I'm not very fluent, but I am trying to learn every single day because that's the only way I can communicate to my grandparents. They're not very fluent in English either. And I don't expect them to be because they live in India and I should know my own language, which unfortunately a lot of, Indian kids in my generation don't. And it's so unfortunate because there's no way they can have a good conversation with their grandparents and mm. not being able to have that is so crucial and it's so sad that we don't. Yeah. And there you're in a community, you live in Northern California, is that correct? Can you t speak a little bit about the first generation or in your case, you were born in India, but can you talk a little bit about the Indian community here in the States of kids and their connections back to India? It's a really important topic. And I wonder if you can shed some light on that. Yeah, okay. A lot of our parents assimilated here and we all grew up in a very, very different household than they did. There was always an emphasis on education and being mindful of that. But along that way, a lot of our culture went missing because 
a lot of the kids nowadays don't really pay that much attention to it because they're bombarded by a thousand other things, which if you're a high school kid and you just know what I'm talking about, that appreciation for the culture and language and the heritage definitely dwindles away slowly. I don't want it to and I want to keep that and that's what keeps us together and that's what keeps us united. But somehow, even through all that, I feel like there's still a little bit of disconnection through our Indian community, which is, I want to bring that power back and that unity back. What are some ways that you can see doing that? You've already started doing that. I think right now there's no clear website for kids in my generation would understand that are Indian. So I want to create a one-stop shop of everything, all the traditions that we have and put them all in there and give them an explanation and every all the materials you need for it and what food is supposed to be eaten and what it signifies and just hmm. create a simple interactive website where kids can go and understand what our culture is and what our grandparents did. And maybe I'll include some videos of my grandparents cooking the food and talking in our native tongue. So they kind of always remain on there and have that impact on the couple of next coming generations. What I'm hearing you talk about is, is deep connections back to your Indian roots. Right. Yeah. Uh, in terms of language and cooking and food. And is that what you're talking about? Yeah. I was fortunate enough recently to come back from India and spend some time there, my first time there. And I quite honestly quite fell in love with the place. Education. And you spoke about this before, the importance of education in Indian culture. Can you speak a little bit about that, how the, the similarities and differences in the way that crosses over from the, the way that Indian kids transition when they come here to the States or when they migrate to the States or you've spent time in both countries. So lean into that a little bit. If you I think education, no matter where you are, if you're living in India or here and if you're in an Indian, in an Indian household, it's been emphasized since as long as I can remember. My grandparents talk about it every single time they call me. My aunts and uncles, that's the number one thing that we talk about, the fact that you just bless them like good luck on like school good luck on your future and all of that and it's such a it's such a prominent part of our culture where i would be shocked if someone didn't tell me like how are you, how's school how are you doing i would just be like so where's my question it's definitely important it comes near to the top of one of the most important because it's something you have with you forever and i mentioned this before but you can never lose education you might be able to lose money respect but you never lose your education i think that knowledge sticks with you forever and if you're fortunate enough to have it, you might as well keep it. And in your case, what I'm hearing you say is pass it on, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of wisdom here. What would be your advice for Indian parents or any parents for that matter here in the States or in India who are thinking about sending their kids to school, college or graduate school here in the States based on what you know so far? And there's a great number of experiences that you've had and the, the growth that you've experienced over the course of your time in India and here. What would be your, your advice to them, to parents? and to kids alike. I think my advice would to understand and hear your kid out because sometimes I do understand that the communication is obviously missed and there are some ripples along the way. Fortunately, I have parents that know me more better than I know myself and I'm so lucky that I had that support system. I definitely would encourage parents to hear their kids out, hear their dreams and motivations and have open conversations about it and brainstorm and see what they want to do for their future. That also enables their confidence in their communication. And I think that's so important. If you don't have a passion, what are you going to create a passion project out of? And I think that's another important thing to emphasize. Everybody deserves to have something that they love and something that they can pursue. So I'd say just have open conversation with your kid, hear them out, listen to what they have to say, and obviously give them some input and give them your guidance, but don't push your more or like your goals onto them because everyone's different. I grew up the way I did because because my parents empowered me to be who I am and have my own voice and not depend on their goals because everyone's varies and everyone deserves to have that own. Talk about, this is a, a wonderful thing that you said. If you don't have passion, you can't have a passion project. Will you repeat that and, and repeat the thoughts around that so we can capture that? Right. Yeah. If you don't have a passion, you can't create a passion project. And that's so crucial when someone's developing as a human being because everyone deserves to be passionate about something. And have something to focus on and have a goal to move towards in your future. And when your parents slightly hover over that and enforce their own goals onto yours, it's not as fun and you lose that enjoyment of having something of your own and creating your own brand. I think it's really important that you cultivate that own legacy and that you leave behind for yourself and people recognize you for. Two things you said that I want to talk about. Talk about parents hovering. I guess you're talking about helicopter parents when you talk about parents hovering. What's your view on that? And 
complying with what your parents want versus kind of finding your own way? My parents are so generous with whatever I want to do because they know I push myself and I will push back if anything is ever pushed upon me. Mm -hmm. I think I'm also kind of kid that that has my own visions for the future. And I feel like I've always been that way, especially if kids are slightly more reserved in their nature. I think giving them an opportunity to speak out and speak about what they're passionate about, whether it's a colloquial conversation with them, just like enjoying some sort of like random discussion just to see what brightens their day or like what they light up about and recognizing that and pursuing that for them because sometimes they don't understand it themselves rather than pushing your own goals onto them being helicopter parents whether it's the fact that you don't really get to grow and once you're in college what do i do without them now they're not independent anymore and they're dependent on you whether it's a good thing for the first five years of your life you miss out on that part of growing yourself as an individual in the yeah Yeah. you talked about your brand and finding your own brand which is your years ahead of your time when it comes to marketing education i think this is either written onto your helical code you've just absorbed it what's your brand What's your view on branding and personal branding? I think my brand depends on how others view me. I think the question of my brand should be not to be offensive, but what do you think my brand is? Oh, so right back at me. That's a great question. I want to just reflect back on the insights that you gave, which was that your brand is how other people see you. Here's how I see you in our short time of, of working together. And with the understanding, as I've told you before, that I don't give compliments for the sake of giving compliments. I see you as a, a very bright, shining light who is able to lean into things that are uncomfortable for you. Uh, Case in point, raising money. You hadn't done this before. It was your first time doing it. Take some gentle suggestions from me, which are predicated on the ideas that you had already, and just run with them. You're unstoppable. And I think you embrace that. I think you embrace that in a way that is uniquely you. I don't think anybody but Anya could have taken this initiative and taken it forward. One of the reasons that I do what I do is to have the privilege of working with extraordinary young people like you. You've already talked about your future and wanting to give back to the world. I think that's a very important thing. So that's my candid hit on you, Anya, and our month and a half of working together so far. How does that land with you? That's exactly how I hope others vision me. So thank you. (laughs) I can only speak for this other, but this other sees you that way. I'm so grateful for your time. I'm really grateful for the for the time that we spend together. And I feel very privileged to be mentoring you. Any final words of wisdom to kids or parents out there who want to be doing what you've just done, which is to try and identify a cause that they're passionate about, raise some money for it in a very specific way, and take that forward? Yeah, I would say lead with the CEO mindset of clarity, communication, and conduct. You want to have those three very important variables to be successful and reach your goals. Good luck to everyone watching, and I hope you get where you want to get to. So awesome, Anya. Thanks. We'll see you next time. Let's wave goodbye to our crowd. Bye. Bye.